Hey guys, it's Rose. It's time for a new kind of wrap-up, a wrap-up based on my theme reading for last month, which you may remember was Series September. I will put a link below to a little video I made about why I was reading Series last month and why I decided to do some theme reading. Also, a link to a video that I made about my theme for October, which is, shockingly, spooky reading and Halloween reading. As soon as that video goes up, I will add that link below as well. I did read two whole books that were not part of series, so I'm just going to skim through them really quickly. I finished Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus by John Gray, famous self-help book from a couple of decades ago, and I actually just picked this up because I've never read it, and it's pop culture referenced all over the place. I wanted to see what the fuss had been about when it was really popular. I mean, it's, it's awful. It's based on gender roles and assuming what your other part, what your partner is thinking, rather than simply talking to them about it. And it's generally a terrible book, but I'm glad that I read it because now I can make fun of it and I can appreciate pop culture jokes about it a little bit more. And it wasn't exactly a difficult read, so. The other book that I read this month that's not part of a series is The Martian by Andy Weir. This is an absolutely awesome book. Obviously, it is being made into a movie with Matt Damon in it. That movie has just come out, and it's apparently amazing. I haven't seen it yet. I've done quite a bit of writing about it, though. So let's start with The Girl in the Spider's Web. This was a continuation of the Millennium series, aka The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo series by Stieg Larsson. I've talked about this one in more detail in a review, so again, I will put a link to that below. However, I did want to talk about it a little bit more in terms of how it relates to the rest of the series, because that's kind of what this month is about. This was a really interesting one because the first three books were very clearly a trilogy. It's kind of a classic way to do a trilogy, so it was really interesting to have a new book come along because it felt like the original trilogy had wrapped things up quite nicely. There's always a fear with that kind of addition to a great series that maybe it's being done because they think they can sell more books. I wasn't a huge fan of it, but it did deal with a sort of a, a, a plot point that wasn't entirely wrapped up in the first trilogy, so it was sort of worth it from that sense, and I think that when working with series, you have to make a decision whether or not you are going to tie up every little loose end, or whether you're going to leave some things as just mystery for the reader. I wasn't thrilled with how they dealt with this sort of lost plot tale. I'm not saying exactly what it is, because I don't want to spoil it for anyone, because it's quite a new book. But I do think it's an interesting concept to sort of complete a trilogy nicely and then pick a, a plot tale or an element or a character and start writing new books about that. It's, it's an interesting way to do things. Um, it's an interesting way to play with the focus and the timeline. Didn't totally work in this case, but it was an interesting thing to think about. Another series that I started and uh, I'm still working through and I'm loving is Outlander by Diana Gabaldon. This also has some interesting stuff because it does a little bit more than just run start to finish point A to point B. These books take place over a couple different time periods. Part of it happens 250-ish years ago in the Scottish Highlands, and part of it happens in more modern times. We're talking about the 40s, the 60s, the 70s, so not exactly right now modern times, but a lot a lot closer to it than Scottish Highland history times. <laughs> the interesting thing about that is that because you're getting some bits from the future or from the past, you get little hints of things that are going to happen in the other timeline. So what we have here is a series that somehow both goes just in a straight chronological order and doesn't. It combines the two. It's really, really interesting for that. It also changes up the pattern a little bit as well. In the initial book, we get the beginning chapters, very few chapters, just a couple of them in the 40s. Then we switch to the distant past, and we end in the distant past. In the second book, we do something similar. We begin in the 60s and then go to the distant past. And toward the end, we start to see little bits from the 60s and little bits from the past. 
by the time that we're in the third book, which is called Voyager, we're now switching back and forth fairly consistently between the 60s and the distant past. So it's, it's an interesting thing to note with a series because it shows how you can change up not just the timeline, but also the general framework of your writing. You don't need to have every single book follow the same framework. She doesn't need to do every book starts with five chapters in the present, 50 chapters in the past, or chapter to chapter to chapter to chapter. You can switch that up, but it still feels quite nice and rhythmic, and it makes sense. It doesn't feel awkward, which timeline switching sometimes can. So I think it's a really, really well done series so far. Like I say, I'm halfway through the third book. There are plenty to go. I'm really excited about them. I'm really, really into these books now. The other thing I want to mention about the Outlander series, which also applies to the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo series and applies to the vast majority of sequential novels, is that most series will have, as I mentioned earlier, kind of a background plot line, but each individual novel within it has a smaller story arc that gets wrapped up. One of the best known examples of this is obviously Harry Potter. Within the Harry Potter series, each year, i.e. each book, Harry has one sort of that year adventure, the Philosopher's Stone, the Prisoner of Azkaban, the Half-Blood Prince, etc. But in the background, there's this overall storyline of the return of Voldemort happening that becomes the focus at the very end. It seems like a really obvious thing because it's so common, and I almost didn't want to mention it, but it's worth bringing up because you don't have to do that. And the reason for doing that, the reason that that's so common, I think, is that what it does, it means that after you've read each book, you get that nice sort of satisfied glow of, ah, oh, that got resolved, and I feel like I was taken on this little ride with these characters, and now I know how it ends. Great. But you're still interested to read the next one. You still want to know what happens next, what the next stage in a big adventure is. And that's really satisfying from a practical perspective, because it makes you want to read more, but it doesn't drive you completely insane with frustration. Case in Point is another series that I have not been reading this month, but that I've read in the past by Jeffrey Archer. These series, The Clifton Chronicles, are very straightforward. You start at a beginning point in time, and you just work your way through there. There's the odd flashback, but that's it. However, these are absolute cliffhanger endings. Rather than doing the sort of nice little wrap-up, and we know something else is going to happen, but we got a sense of closure on this adventure, these don't do that. These are like episodes of a soap opera, and they actually usually end with a bomb being found on a boat, or someone in an accident and we don't know if they're dead or not, or someone revealing they're, they're pregnant and we don't know whose kid it is. They're very over-the-top cliffhanger endings. On the one hand, it makes the reading move very quickly, it makes you want to read the next book, like right then and there, but when he hasn't finished the series and he hasn't written the next book, oh, it's annoying. It's really annoying. <laughs> so in some ways that actually works against the writer because part of me, now that, I've, now that I started reading these books, which I started reading because um, a relative lent me the first few, I will continue reading the rest of the series because I really want to know what happens. However, I am not going to pick up another Jeffrey Archer book unless I know that he's finished that entire series completely. It's been a while because I don't want to deal with this cliffhanger again. And if you're writing, that's something to bear in mind. You want to keep your reader engrossed. You want them to want to keep reading. You don't want to piss them off, though, because you don't piss off your reader. Come on, that should be kind of basic. Another thing that I wanted to talk about that is very prevalent in Outlander, but that's also quite common for series, and that is a massive pet peeve of mine, is recapping. While I'm all for summing up each mini story arc per novel, I really dislike it when each new novel starts and you get a weird little interjected summary of what happened in the last one. It's rarely done 
smoothly. It ends up being a situation where something is mentioned and then you get a few paragraphs of, we'll mention this character. This character is the guy who did this thing in the last book. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. It feels like a breaking of the fourth wall. It feels like when you're watching a play and the actor turns and talks to the audience. And while that can work for certain things, obviously I can't hate that entirely. It, Shakespeare did it for God's sake. I don't enjoy it. I really don't enjoy it in the books because it takes me out of it a little bit. It's like, I like to get lost in my books. I like to really lose myself in it. And doing that little recap, I find it very jarring. So I'm not a fan of that. It does happen in Outlander and it's the one thing in this series so far that makes me kind of itch. It happens in a lot of series. One of the things that I really loved about the Steve Larson Millennium books is that he does not do that. Like at all. It's very much written kind of with the, with the viewpoint that you should know what's happening because you should have read the last one. If you haven't read the last one, well then go back and read it because you will be completely confused. George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire also does this. He does not go back and recap what's happening with every character when we meet them again, partially because that would make it, you know, twice as long and these are some hefty books to begin with, but also because you get the general feeling that he is, he's not going to bother babying the reader into remembering what's happened. If you don't remember, go back and reread it. I prefer that. I'm sure that many would disagree with that. If you really like the recaps, I would love to know why. I would love to hear about the fact that you love it and the reasons for that. So feel free to comment on that one. It's a pet peeve of mine, but I recognize that not everyone feels that way. Last up for series September, I want to talk about these. These are the Ancient Egypt books by Wilbur Smith, and they took up the vast majority of my reading this month. Again, these aren't teeny tiny books. They're pretty hefty, but I'm really glad of it because this is a really interesting series to talk about and to talk about, and he did something really different with this. This isn't, most of the others are variations on, we're starting it here, we're going to here, along a timeline. This is totally different, and it's really interesting to talk about, so hopefully you find it interesting. The first book very simple. I love this book. If you haven't read it, I always recommend it. This is a very straight up point A to point B memoir in a way. It is actually based on a series of scrolls that were the memoir of an Egyptian slave that were found in a royal tomb. That is real. That is the non-fiction part of this book, which is really cool. And Wilbur Smith was asked to take these sort of translations and work them into a novel that's appropriate for a modern audience. He did it brilliantly. It's, it's perfect. I mean, this is just an incredible book. I bawl my eyes out when I read this book every single time at one particular point, even though I know it's coming. I've read this book eight times and it still makes me cry. And eight is kind of a number I plucked out of the ether. It's probably actually more than that. But this is amazing. The remaining four books do something really interesting. So the first book is called River God. The second book that he wrote is The Seventh Scroll. And this is a completely different style. Because the first book was based on these scrolls that were found in a tomb, and they actually describe a tomb built into the, the cliffs in Ethiopia that has not been found, so that as far as I know, a lot of speculation came out after the book did about whether this tomb might still exist. And so his follow-up to the first book wasn't to continue the story of the characters. They really don't appear in it at all. But to cover kind of like an Indiana Jones-style treasure hunters going after this tomb. It's a really interesting idea for a sequel. Most sequels are just, we're going to continue where I left off, or we're going to do a prequel, or we're going to do another area of the world building. This is so different, and it was really cool. The book is a very different style. River God is a historical fiction. Seventh Scroll is more of a, it's Indiana Jones. It's kind of like an action adventure thing, and there's the evil archaeologists and treasure seekers, and there's like the good 
archaeologists and treasure seekers and they come to literal blows over it many times and there's helicopters and machine guns and it's 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 more James Bond than it is Philippa Gregory and I'm okay with that as long as you're expecting that I think you may actually quite enjoy this book basically it plays off some of the reader reactions to the first book and I think that was just a fascinating idea. I'm not really aware of any other series who have done, that have done something like that. So if you are, I would love to hear about them. After The Seventh Scroll, Wilbur Smith published two more books that work quite well together, The Quest and Warlock. These two go back to the timeline of River God after a generation or two. So rather than picking up where the first book left off, this picks up... 50 years after the first book left off. These two, however, I wasn't a big fan of. For one thing, they very much felt like an attempt to continue to make money off of a very popular book. There's a couple characters that carry over from River God into these books, but they change a lot. They don't totally feel like the same character. It sort of feels like a name slapped on a new character because everyone knows that name and we like it. There's even a couple bits in these books that contradict information that was provided in the first book and inconsistencies really bother me. I'm one of those nerdy people where I go, no, no, if you said that her baby name was Lanata, and then in this one you say that her baby name is Fen, I'm gonna be annoyed. Because it's one or the other, and it was a big deal in the first book that it was this one, so why is it another now? Don't do that. It also really changed the style. So these go back to sort of point A to point B. The main character starts here and we follow him for 20 years. But Rather than a sort of action and relationship-based historical fiction, these two go way off the supernatural deep end. They are no longer something that I would ever consider historical fiction. I think they are pure figments of imagination. They're full of, like, spells and magic and witches, and it's weird because it just doesn't feel the same at all. There's there's also so much bizarrely placed sex in these that I don't even know what to do with it. They read like softcore porn in parts. They're just, they're not great. The interesting thing about that, however, is that because this series jumps all over the place, you don't have to read them. <laughs> Completely unnecessary. Um, and if I were you, I wouldn't, because they're really not that good. Finally, we have Desert God, which is the most recent addition to the series. Obviously, the name tells you a lot about what we're doing with this one. River God, Desert God picks up where River God left off, almost. Um, there's a small time gap. There's, I think, probably about 20 years of a time gap between the two books, but that's quite small. We get more of the characters carrying over from one to the other, so we see kind of characters that were children when River God ended are now adults in Desert God. We lose a vast amount of the crazy over-the-top sex and supernatural magic-y stuff that appeared in Warlock and the Crest, which was so reassuring. Um, it actually felt really great <laughs> to get rid of some of that and go back to more of a historical fiction novel. The characters seemed a little closer to how they did in the beginning. Um, and while it was still not as good as River God, it was definitely a lot better than the, the, the previous two. So this is one of those really interesting series that can be read in several ways. I, I think it's kind of cool when that happens. Um, it gives you a lot of options for how you want to do things. It's sort of like debating whether or not you want to watch the Star Wars in release order, or in episode one to six order, or in a different order altogether. It's, it's kind of it's fun to be able to mix it up. So in publication order, we go River God, Seventh Scroll, Warlock, Quest, Desert God. If you wanted to go start to finish chronologically, you would go River God, Desert God, Warlock, Quest, and Seventh Scroll. 
And if you wanted to read it the way that I think that this series should be read, you're going to skip out two books altogether and read River God the Quest and Seventh Scroll. And the, the great thing about that is you are going to lose nothing in that reading. You can skip two huge books because they're just not that good, and it doesn't impact the series at all. The final thing to say about the River God series is that it was kind of weird, but quite interesting, to get this kind of transparency over the author's motives in writing these books. River God is the one that started it all. Seventh Scroll was a way to create a sequel, and I feel like he was still very passionate about it. The Quest and Warlock very much felt like money grabbers. Um, maybe they weren't, obviously. I haven't exactly sat down with Wilbur Smith and asked him, but they felt that way. And Desert God felt like more of a return to the beginning. It's quite cool to see a mindset there of what can I write next? How can I expand the series? What can I do when the series that I started was never intended to be a series? And it's the difference between something that's an intentional trilogy and something that's, hey, this was really popular, maybe I should keep writing about it. And it's interesting to see the different ways that he's tried to approach extending the series and to see which worked and which didn't. And that's it! Obviously this was quite a long video. I had a lot to talk about because I took a lot away from reading series only this month and comparing the ways that authors did different things. I wish I'd had a chance to read more. Unfortunately, because the quest and Warlock were really not very good, um, and The Girl in the Spider's Web was nowhere near as good as the first three, it took me a lot longer to read these books than I thought it would, so I didn't get a chance to read Dune or reread Chronicles of Narnia. C'est la vie, it is uh, more books to read in future. I hope this wasn't too long for you, I hope you enjoyed it, um, I hope you found it a little bit interesting and a bit of a different way to do a wrap-up, so let me know what you think of the new format, and have a great day!